Speaking of silent movies, do you know who else made a silent movie? Mel Brooks made a silent movie. And you know what he called his silent movie? He called it Silent Movie. <laughs> movies about movies, number 12. And Vita, 13. Well, I've never read anything about silent movie that didn't spoil at least one of the jokes, but I will not do that. I refuse to do that. That's my pledge to you. Uh, Mel Brooks and his team worked very hard to make these jokes, and they deserve the laughs. I don't know why reviewers like to tell the jokes they find in comedies. I, 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 I just like having jokes spoiled even more than having plot twists spoiled. Well, okay, the whole premise of this picture is a joke, so there's no way around that. But that's on the poster, so I'm not spoiling that. The premise comes from comedy writer Ron Clark. At its core, it's a really simple idea. What if we made a modern silent movie? He pitched that to Mel Brooks, who liked the idea. And Mel, by the way, had just released two back-to-back -back spectacular hits, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, both in one year, 1974. The head of production at Fox was Alan Ladd Jr. He was a little skeptical, but Brooks argued the picture would make money because he would load it up with A-list stars. Ladd said yes. Mel Brooks recruited Rudy DeLuca and Barry Levinson to help him and Ron Clark write the picture. All of them were fans of the classic silent comedians, and they just piled gag upon gag upon gag. They even had Buster Keaton's widow as a consultant. As a result, the world has an additional 87 wonderful minutes of laughs to enjoy. The gags are solid. A surprising number of them are verbal jokes. Big thank you to Alan Ladd Jr. for saying yes. Now, unlike the artist, Silent Movie makes no attempt to take us back to the period of silent films. That's the joke. That's the one joke I can't avoid spoiling. The joke is, it's not a period piece. It's contemporary. It's a widescreen color movie. We just can't hear the dialogue. Okay, it is a period piece now. It's 38 years old. It's from the mid-70s. It has that look, that look of low-budget films and TV shows of the 70s, back before digital color grading became popular, or even possible for that matter. It's that flat, bright, sunny California look. And it has stars from the 70s. This is the first film where Mel Brooks cast himself in the lead. Marty Feldman and Dom DeLuise play his on-screen sidekicks. Of the trio, it's Feldman who has the best skills for doing slapstick physical gags. He's very impressive at it. So to recap, here's what we have. The real-life Mel Brooks, actual director at the peak of his career, pitches a modern silent movie to an actual major studio on the basis he's going to pack it with big stars. In the movie, he plays a fictional director at the bottom of his career who pitches a modern silent movie to a fictional studio on the basis he's going to pack it with big stars. The studio chief is played by Sid Caesar in full twitch. Caesar had only a modest movie career, but he was a TV comedy god at the dawn of television. Mel Brooks wrote for him back then. The film is structured very simply. Brooks, Don DeLuise, and Marty Feldman drive around Beverly Hills to recruit the promised cast of big stars. Actual A-listers including Paul Newman, James Caan, Burt Reynolds, Liza Minnelli, and Mrs. Mel Brooks, the amazing Anne Bancroft, the graduate's Mrs. Robinson. So what we have is, is a string of sketches, one for each star. Now, threatening the production of the fictional silent movie is a villainous corporation that wants the studio to fail so it can buy them out. Cheap. Harold Gould and Ron Carey are the principals of the evil corporation. Bernadette Peters is their sexy, seductive secret weapon. And they will stop at nothing to stop Mel's character from completing the film that can save the studio. Do the gags still hold up? Well, some may have dated references. Some may be too broad for modern tastes. Mel Brooks is never one for finesse. He throws everything he can think of at the screen. Some of them are going to make you laugh. Till next time, I'm Mikola. DVD extras. I said I wouldn't spoil any jokes, but there is one joke that I really thought hard about spoiling. It's a joke that makes me wince. It's a joke that pops up twice in Silent Movie. It made me wince both times. I'll bet it would not be in the picture if the picture were made today, but I won't spoil it. If you watch the picture, you'll notice it. A number of movies in this series are set against a background of disruption. For example, Sunset Boulevard, Singing in the Rain, and The Artist all have a background of technological disruption, the coming of sound. Silent Movie is set against a business disruption, something that was roiling the picture industry in the 70s, and it's still going on. Corporate takeovers. This was a period when Warner Brothers was owned by a company that ran parking lots, and Paramount was owned by a company that made swimsuits, sugar, zinc, auto parts, and mattresses. And Columbia Pictures was owned by a soft drink company. Well, that didn't last long. The soft drink company quickly unloaded Columbia on a Japanese television set manufacturer. The studio where Mel made this movie, 20th Century Fox, was still independent when he made it, but even Fox was diversifying. 
It invested in soft drink bottling, a ski resort, movie theaters in Australia. Fox had a pretty good decade in the 70s under the creative leadership of Alan Ladd Jr. Ladd not only invested in Mel Brooks's crazy idea to make a silent movie, he also bankrolled another wacky idea. Some kid came in with a script for a science fiction film about droids, an evil empire, a young farm boy, and a princess. Ladd said yes. Thank you for that. Ladd eventually left to start his own company. But even making piles of money couldn't save Fox from being taken over by a guy who made his fortune in the oil business, Marvin Davis. Davis did not run the studio well, and he did not keep it for long. He sold it to an Australian publisher who still owns it. The modern era of mergers isn't so much about diversification as it is about concentration, finding synergies between distribution and production, but that's probably a video of its own. Ice Bucket Update. As of August 26th, donations passed $88.5 million. Here's the folks who've accepted my tag so far. Rory Hollywood even got naked. Here's my review of this weekend's Doctor Who. Here's some classic Sid Caesar TV sketches, including a couple about silent movies and some written by Mel Brooks. And more of my reviews on movies about movies. I give you four choices. I wonder how many of you are going to click the naked guy. Bye now.